Welcome to our morning service at Hayes Town Chapel. A good morning to you who are watching on YouTube, listening in online, and the few of us who are gathered together in the chapel this morning, seeking to test out our, our, our facilities in anticipation of, in the very near future, opening up uh, our morning worship here on the chapel to all who are uh, able to come. I'm going to begin with a few notices. Uh, this evening, God willing, we meet on Zoom when David Philpot, one of our elders here, will be leading our thoughts on the letter to the Hebrews, which we are looking at on Sunday evenings. The Communion Fund for July will be going to support the work of Daylight Christian Prison Trust. First group for Christianity Explored met on Zoom on Friday, and I'm leading the course along with Ruth, who's with me, for the sessions. The second group will be meeting this week. If you'd like more information, please contact either Ruth or me or contact us on our helpline, which I'll be giving in a moment. The ladies' reading group will meet on Zoom tomorrow evening between 7.45 and 8.45 p.m. The ladies will be discussing Chapter 2 of the Good Portion Salvation. I think Chapter 2 is called A Garden Sin. Tuesday evening's Meeting at 7.45 will this week be led by David and our brother John Lodge will be uh, speaking to us. Next Lord's Day, Chumman Shom will be leading the morning service and I expect to be leading the evening service. Let's begin our service proper by singing together a hymn in which we worship our God, who we worship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Number 46, Heaven Father, our Creator. commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, our gracious and our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that through the merits of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
and as enabled by your Holy Spirit sent into our hearts, we thank you that through your Son and by your Spirit we may in full assurance of faith draw near to you, though you are the Lord high and lifted up, the thrice holy God, we may indeed draw near to you through your Son's merits and dare to call you with your Son, Abba Father. Thank you for who you are in all your matchless splendour. Thank you for all that you've done for us. You are our creator and our preserver. Every good and perfect gift comes from your hand. Most of all, though, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son and all those spiritual blessings that are ours in and through him and all that he was willing to endure for our sakes and for our salvation. And we thank you by faith for all you yet do for us, because I has not seen or has ear heard the things you've prepared for those who love you. And as we think this morning of what it meant for the Lord Jesus to secure these untold and innumerable blessings, we pray that as a result of our meeting together, we may know him more clearly and love him more dearly and follow him more nearly, day by day and forever. We pray for all who are either watching or listening in who are, or are present this morning. Lord, you know our circumstances better than we know them ourselves. Lord, for some, it's a tough time just now. But Lord, you know the way that we take. And we thank you that your grace is sufficient for each one of us. And as our Lord Jesus has reminded us that we do not live by bread only, grant, we pray, that as we turn to your word, that we may have ears attuned to hear your voice speaking directly to us. That we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Saviour if we already know him. Or if we don't know where we stand really, Lord, in relation to you, grant even this day, we pray, that we may realise what it is to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to know the one whom to know is eternal life. These things we pray, committing our time together to you now, in the name of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, who with you and the Holy Spirit we worship as the one true and living God, blessed for ever. Amen. On Sunday mornings we are travelling through Mark's Gospel. This morning we've reached the account of the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. So I'd invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 14. The reading will appear on the screen, but uh, if you're following in your Bible, we'll begin at verse 32 of Mark, chapter 14. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not watch, keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They didn't know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is God's word. May he bless it to us each one. Now, those of you who consider yourselves children, listen up. This spot is for you. 
I'm going to put a sign, or we're going to have a sign come up on the screen just now. I wonder if anyone recognises this well-known logo. Give you a little time to think. Nobody here is to shout out because we've got to keep our voices down, but you and your households at home, little, little thought. Well, you may well have already recognised it. it's the Nike logo, isn't it? Does anyone know, I wonder, Nike's slogan or strapline, maybe the phrase you use? Have a little think. Before I tell you, it's just do it. Now, in some ways, I think that's a pretty good slogan. Many of us expect other people to sort us out and give us a handout when we ought to be sorting ourselves out. Just getting on and doing what we are perfectly capable of doing, but just too lazy and too spoiled to do it. But there are some things in life you just cannot, we just cannot do for ourselves and mustn't be too proud to admit that we can't just do it on our own. And that's especially true when it comes to getting right with God and being ready to meet him when we die. Many people think it's all down to what we can do. Their religion is all about doing. You might call it DIY salvation, do-it-yourself salvation. Now, if that's you, you're just like a rich young man who once came to Jesus and asked him this, as we will see on our next slide. I should have mentioned to those who are just listening in, I should have described the Nike sign, so I'm sorry that I forgot to do that, but coming on the screen now are the words of the, the rich young man who came to Jesus and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice that? What must I do? Judging by what he told Jesus later, he'd been doing lots of things already to try to make himself good enough for God, but as is always the case when it's all down to what you can do, you can never, we can never really be sure whether we've done enough. The thing is, none of us can ever do enough to get right with God. That's because we're all badly messed up in our lives and our personalities, and we all, all the time, are coming short of what we should be, and what God made us to be. Now, you might be better than other people, you might even congratulate yourself you're better than other people, as did the very religious man in one of Jesus' stories when he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. That's a bit like what happened to me when I was at school many, many years ago. We had just had a Latin test. Do they still teach Latin at school, I wonder? And uh, I can't remember my exact score, but let's say it was seven. And I can't remember exactly my friend in the next desk to me, his score. Let's say it was 14. Twice as much as I got. Well, my friend started to congratulate himself that he'd done so much better than me. And it seemed others were doing the same with their friends in the class. But the Latin master soon brought us all down to earth by reminding us that the score was out of 100. So whether you got 7, whether you got 14 or 28, you had nothing really to boast about, had you? And that's how it is with us. You may think you're better than other people. You may be better than other people. You may not. You may think you are. But one thing's for certain, when it comes to making ourselves good enough for God, we just can't, we, we just, we can't just do it. DIY salvation is a hopeless non-starter. But how, coming up now is another logo. For those who can't see, I'm, we're seeing a picture of a plain cross. Now, what sort of motto, what sort of strap line might we put under this logo, I wonder? Have a little think. How about this one? Coming up on screen are some words of Jesus that he spoke on the cross. It is finished. John chapter 19, verse 30. You know, Jesus could almost have said, done. Jesus has done everything that needs to be done to put you right with God. As the hymn puts it, he died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven saved and secure by his precious blood. Now, I wonder which logo best sums up your religion this morning. The Nike sign, just do it. It's all about doing as far as you're concerned. 
or the sign of the cross. It is finished. It's all been done. Is yours a do religion or a done religion? Are you trusting in yourself and what you can do to get you right with God? Do you think you're pretty good at DIY when it comes to salvation? Or at least, if you do your best, God will do the rest. Or is your trust wholly and solely in the one who said, it is finished, it's all been done, there's nothing more to do? Now, why do I mention all this this morning, when we just read about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, I do so for this reason. The cry, it is finished, it's actually one word in the language in which the New Testament was written. Tetelestai, done. Interesting, one of the meanings of that word is paid in full. You produced a bill and you paid it, you'd have tetelestai written across it, paid in full. And it's like that when it comes to our sin. We've got a huge, humongous debt to pay. We are hopelessly in debt, each one of us, every one of us is hopelessly in debt to God. And the fact is, again to quote that hymn I quoted just now, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin other than the Lord Jesus. And he was willing to pay that price in full to take on our debt himself. But what a cost. And this morning, as we look later together at what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, I trust we'll see, or just get a, even a little insight into how stressed and overwhelming, to put it mildly, was even the thought to the Lord Jesus of what paying that price would mean. Yet, as we'll also see, although he had to go that way, there was no other one good enough. Although he had to go that way, there's a sense in which he need not have gone through that dreadful ordeal that he had to go through to fix things for you and me. Or for the likes of you and me. And he did, so only be, he did so only because he was willing to do so. He didn't have to, but he was willing to do so. So why do you think he was willing to suffer so horribly as he did, not only in the Garden of Gethsemane, but of course on the cross itself? Well, in the words of a chorus, we're going to sing in a minute, we might ask the question, or hum some of us, or make melody in our hearts, some of us here this morning, to why did Jesus to his cross of shame freely come? He freely came, bearing all my sin and sorrow. Why? Well, the reason he did so was in the words of a famous Christian who, who, who saw it all in terms very personal to himself. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. As we shall sing in a moment, what wondrous love it was that made him do what he did to do for us, to do for the likes of you and me, what we none of us could do for ourselves, because none of us can just do it. But it's, we don't need to, because it's all been done. Jesus said it's finished, done. Are you trusting in what he, he has already done to get you right with God. Let's pray. Let's pray with the children. Lord Jesus, make me understand it. Help me to take it in, what it meant to you, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. Ask this for your name's sake, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to sing a chorus now, not so well known here. I think I sang it last about 50 years ago, but uh, it stuck in my mind. I thought it really summed up a bit what I'm going to try and say about Gethsemane this morning. Number 920, if you've got a hit there and you can't see what comes up on the screen. Higher than the hills, deeper than the deepest sea is the Lord's love to me. So we'll sing together twice through number 920.
now join together in prayer once again. After I've led us in prayer, I invite you in your homes to join with me in the prayer the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And in our uh, congregation here, we'll perhaps speak it quite softly together as we pray the Lord's Prayer. But firstly, let me lead you in prayer. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that nothing restricts you in meeting with us. Thank you that your word is not bound, your spirit is everywhere, and the Lord Jesus is as near as we are, as near as, near as anyone is for calling upon him. Lord, we thank you that your word says the Lord is near to all who call on him. And Lord, we will seek to call on your name now, thanking you that through what the Lord Jesus, your son, has done, we can come into your very presence. And we thank you that though we've reminded ourselves that you are the great and almighty God, you sit, are seated upon a throne of glory. Yet that throne of glory is also a throne of grace, where we can find grace to help us in our time of need. Timely grace. Thank you that we can come to you now. And because you are a great and mighty God, we can bring large petitions to you. Father, we will pray for our world at this time of universal pandemic. We can't claim to understand all your purposes in what is happening just now. But we cannot feel that among your purposes are that this pandemic might, as it were, be a trumpet call of warning, a megaphone to rouse a deaf world that is complacent in its ways, as any of us would be but for your grace. Father, we pray that at such a time as this, when whether we like it or not, we're reminded of our vulnerability, our weakness, the uncertainty of life, humanly speaking, that you will speak into this situation and prepare people's hearts for the message of sure and certain hope that is found only in the gospel, the good news about your son. Lord, we know it's a testing time for your people worldwide. Some are already being tested because of persecution and we would lift them up before you. But added to this is what is happening as a result of this pandemic. Lord, we think of some nations that are struggling just now because the coronavirus seems to be uh, moving through the nations in in, in some places in, in an exponential way. And we pray, Father, for your overruling in this situation. Here are our prayers. We pray for our nation too. You've taught us to pray for our government and we pray for the Prime Minister and, the, and all those who are responsible for making decisions. We know that it is, it is a situation where, the, where, so to speak, where things are moving and things are being discovered because uh, this is a new situation. So we pray for wisdom and we pray for patience and understanding. We pray, Lord, that wise decisions may be made as we move towards some kind of lockdown. Here are our prayers for all those who are affected, not only uh, physically but psychologically, because they've been shut in for some time, and economically. Lord, we, what seems to be looming on the horizon are great economic challenges. Father, we pray that could it please you to humble us as a nation and bring us to realise our need of you. Lord, you've called us to be your people at such a time as this. We pray for the churches of this land where the Lord Jesus is loved, where the gospel is preached, that you will use us to be beacons of hope and certainty in a world of despair and uncertainty. And so we will pray finally for ourselves, Lord, that you will use us as a community of your people here to be a blessing to this neighbourhood. Give us discernment to see the doors of opportunity that this, even this situation presents to us and you're so to speak giving us we might only see them but seize them and be used by you to bring that message of peace with you reconciliation forgiveness new life and sure and certain hope to a needy world and as we pray for ourselves we pray for one another some have passed through deep waters recently lost loved ones and and, and the situation of grief has been exacerbated by the, the stringent measures that have been in place of necessity, but sadly. So we comfort that. We pray you'll comfort those who mourned or are mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for those who are unwell, for those who can't meet with us like this. We commit each other to your care and keeping. 
It will give us all understanding at these times. We're all trying to cope with what's the best way forward. Lord, help us to be patient and understanding of one another, to learn of one another, that we might move forward governed by your wisdom. Thank you, Lord, that we're not left just to our own devices. We thank you for your word. And as we come to the sacred text shortly, may he who caused the scriptures to be written but for our learning be to us the great interpreter spirit. Father, we pray that through the ministry of your spirit that our eyes might be open to see Jesus for who he is, for what he's done for us, and what should be our response to him. So, Father, hear our prayers, we ask. Accept our praise and thanksgiving. Pardon our every sin, we ask, as we pray all these things in the name of your dear Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, he who himself taught us how to pray together and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we come to look into God's word, let's sing together Hymn number 542, I've chosen it particularly for the second verse. Consider Christ, that he could trust his Father, e'en in the garden of Gethsemane. The hymn number 542. Should be. 
Some people say, you Christians have no right to claim that Jesus is the only way to God. Surely all roads lead to God. Well, actually, it's the Lord Jesus himself who claims to be the only way to God and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Now, there are several things I could say to demonstrate that Jesus is the only way to God. This morning, though, I'll simply content myself by inviting you to come with me into a garden, a garden called Gethsemane. Supper's now over. Jesus has finished his upper room instruction to his disciples, as John tells us at length in his gospel. He's also offered what we now call his great high priestly prayer. They sing a hymn together. They leave the upper room. We may imagine Jesus and his disciples walking through the streets of Jerusalem in the stillness of the light and in the soft light of the full Passover moon. On the way, Jesus predicts that uh, his disciples would desert him. We heard last week, didn't we, how Peter remonstrated, self-confidently challenged Jesus' words, at least in respect of himself. We can imagine then crossing the Kidron Valley and beginning to climb the Mount of Olives. But they turn off into a garden, probably an olive orchard. Judging by its name, it's called Gethsemane, which means oil press. It's a regular haunt of theirs. John tells us that in his Gospel. No doubt it holds many happy and hallowed memories of past visits. Tonight, though, a somber shadow is about to fall, a shadow darker than any that could be projected by the full Passover moon. The shadow will eclipse all those happy memories of that place. It will cast a, cheer, a, a, a chill on the very soul of the Son of God. In that garden called oil press, he'll begin to wrestle in his soul under the pressure of the imminent horror that lies in prospect. Now, it'd be rash and irreverent of me to try to claim the, to plumb the depths of what's going on within him here as he agonises before his father in this garden. None can share his experience at this point. He leaves eight of the twelve, well, they're really eleven now, at the garden entrance. Even the remaining favoured three, they're only taken a little further. He finally leaves them, as Luke tells us in his gospel, about a stone's throw away. You see, Gethsemane, like Calvary and Easter, are witnesses unique to the Lord. In Gethsemane, we might say, we truly stand on holy ground. We behold our God, not seating on a throne high and lifted up, but as the hymn puts it, we view him prostrate in the garden, on the ground, our maker lies. Today's sermon then, in today's sermon, we view Jesus in Gethsemane. What happens in Gethsemane, as I trust you'll see, is that people like you and me, if people like you and me were to be put back in right relationship with God, then the Lord Jesus had no alternative but to go through this agony in Gethsemane, not to mention the infamy of show trials, the indignity of mocking and spitting and jeering, the unbearable pain of scourging, crowning with thorns and crucifixion, and worst of all, as we shall consider shortly, the unspeakable horror of God-forsakenness. And yet, though, as we will see, Jesus shrinks from what lies before him. He nevertheless submits to what lies before him. It's all encapsulated there in verse 36, where Jesus is praying earnestly. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Shrink he may, but submit he must. If he's to open up for the likes of you and me, the only way back to God from the dark paths of sin. Perhaps the most puzzling thing about this event is indeed the fact that as we read in verse 36, Jesus shrinks from what lies before him. 
Abba Father, he says, everything's possible for you. Take this cup from me. What strong language Mark uses, doesn't he, to describe Jesus' feelings. You get it there in verse 33. He took Peter and James and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Matthew reports Jesus saying that he's overwhelmed with sorrow and to the point of death as well. And Luke speaks of Jesus' anguish. What deep emotional turmoil is going on as he, and he expresses it in these words. And, and as he lies prostrate there in the oil press garden, he's pressured in soul by what lies in prospect. Now, we evangelical Christians give due weight to the fact that the Lord Jesus is, as Paul tells us in Romans 9, 5, God over all, blessed forever. At times, though, we may ourselves perhaps shrink from thinking of him shrinking like this from what lies before him, or for that matter, from thinking of the eternal word lying in a manger, gurgling and crying and not able to speak a word. Or, or for that matter, thinking of the omnipresent one, one present everywhere, contracted to a pinprick in a, pinprick in a teenager's womb. Or, or for that matter, from thinking of the omnipotent, the all-powerful one who gives strength to the weary, sitting down by a well because he's tired. Or, or, or of the one who neither slumbers nor sleeps, absolutely shattered and fast asleep in a boat, even in a violent storm. And we might also shrink from thinking of the omniscient one, the all-knowing one, having to grow in wisdom as a boy, not knowing the date of his second coming. And even as in our reading this morning here in Gethsemane, showing voluntary limitations of his knowledge by how he prays, as someone has said, Jesus could not have prayed that the cup might pass and simultaneously know that it would not. Could it be, perhaps like Isaac, he would be spared at the last moment? I wonder if the writer of the Hebrews had this incident in mind when he recorded, as I quote him, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. By the way, that quote from Hebrews, that vivid, almost daring depiction of, depiction of the true humanity of the Lord Jesus comes in the same letter that opens with one of the most majestic declarations of Jesus' full deity. But why does the Lord Jesus shrink from what lies before him? Yes, it shows his true humanity, as I've just said, but he's surely no coward, is he? Not wanting to back out, is he? Going into Gethsemane, after all, wasn't, it wasn't a ploy to give his enemies the slip. It was a well-known haunt for Jesus and his disciples, so it had quite the opposite effect. As I said just now, um, John tells us that Jesus often met, often met in Gethsemane with his disciples. So by going there, he knows he's going to be an easy prey for his betrayer and the high priest's henchmen are out to get him. And the Lord Jesus has long before predicted his sufferings at the beginning of that great section in Luke's Gospel, starting at chapter 9, that talks about his journey to Jerusalem. We read that as he faced what lay before him, he faced it, in Luke's words, resolutely. And yet now coming events, casting their shadow upon his soul, cause it to be violently storm-tossed, don't it? Doesn't it? No way can this imminent uh, torture in itself, I think, explain Jesus' reaction. After all, Jesus himself told his disciples to rejoice and be glad in suffering. And, and that's what many of them would so impressively do in coming days of persecution. Are we seriously to believe that the servants are going to be greater than their master at this point? I'm sure that his betrayal by a friend and the general unbelief and hardness of people's hearts around him, I'm sure that contributed to his sorrow. However, I believe that the, it's in this expression, this or the cup, that we find the real clue to why Jesus shrinks from what lies before him. You see, for Jesus to drink this cup will mean something far more terrible than the cup of hemlock that Socrates, the philosopher, was commanded to drink as the means of his execution, in which we read in history that he apparently drank very cheerfully and quietly. The cup here, though, is actually a symbol often used in the Old Testament. 
to describe the judgment of God. For example, in Psalm uh, 75, verse 8, we read, In the hand of the Lord is a cup of foaming wine mixed with spices. It, he pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. For the Lord Jesus, as his people's substitute sin bearer, he's about to have their sins, in Isaiah's words, laid on him. Surely the, 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 even the very thought of contact, of any kind of, the, any kind of sin, the, the, the ugly and deadly sin virus, even by legal imputation being laid to his account, it would, wouldn't it cause his sinless soul to recoil in holy revulsion and want him to observe the widest possible social distancing from it? And what's more, by drinking that cup and taking the sinner's place, he will be plunged from the bliss of the closest, unimaginably, unimaginably close and sweetest fellowship with his father, right down into the abyss of God-forsakenness. Now, that's the kind of overwhelming prospect that is, in, is before him. Uh, remember that he is the one who's hitherto always enjoyed the light of his father's countenance upon him. So I put it to you. Would the Son of God have gone to such lengths. In, indeed, would God the Father have allowed his Son to go to such lengths if there were other ways for people to get to God? Being the sinless Son of God, though that he was, while Jesus shrinks from what lies before him, he nevertheless submits to what lies before him. Not for one instant does he rebel. Yes, a dreadful darkness engulfs his soul, yet all the while his will remains surrendered to the divine purpose. Shrink he may, but submit he must, for there is no other way. He knows that, of course, doesn't he? After all, he, he's already said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Apostle Paul will put it this way, if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. So if anyone says to you, or if ever you're tempted to wonder to yourself, surely there are more ways to God than one. Surely if anyone's sincere, they'll be accepted by God. Well, if you're tempted to think like this, or anybody says that to you and it makes you wonder, go straight to Gethsemane and think again. Now, here's a thought for you. What I'm going to say is, to me, the most striking thing of all about what's going on here in Gethsemane. And what I want to say is this. Even though I've said just now that Jesus must submit to what lies before him, Despite shrinking from what lies before him, there's actually a sense in which he need not have submitted. I say that again. Although he must submit, there's a sense in which he needn't submit. Now that probably sounds and is on the face of it a contradiction, isn't it? Let me try to explain what I mean. And in order to, what I want to do is bring out Lord to go to such messy, horrible lengths as this, to deal with it. So, as an aside, Surely I shouldn't be trifling with sin, easily giving way to it, doing deals with it. The sin that prompted such shrinking in the garden and such suffering on the cross. Next, let me reassert my proposition that the only way back to God was by way of the cross. Jesus must submit to it. But I'm now saying, aren't I, that there is a sense in which he, the Lord Jesus need not have submitted to what he went through. Let me try to resolve this seeming contradiction this way. What I'm really saying is that while the way of the cross was absolutely necessary for his people's salvation, it was nevertheless, I'm going to borrow a phrase from a, a great Bible teacher and theologian of the last century, Professor John Murray. In one of his books, he says that the death of the Lord Jesus was of, this is the phrase, consequent absolute necessity. Strange phrase you might reach. Let me, you might think, let me unpack that. Consequent absolute necessity. What he meant was that by that phrase is that God was under no necessity whatsoever 
to save any single one of us. The judge of all the earth could have damned each one of us and would have still done what was right. He could in perfect justice have left all of us to perish everlastingly. That's putting it rather bluntly, isn't it? God doesn't, so to speak, owe us forgiveness and eternal life. We live in an age of entitlement, don't we? And we're all perhaps swept up in that to an extent. So an age of entitlement needs to hear loud and clear that it's not a case with God as one man believed on his deathbed. God will forgive me. That's his job. Yet once God had freely and graciously chosen to save us, he was then in consequence bound to only one way. That meant the incarnation, a human life lived out perfectly to a, in a perfect obedience to God's precepts for our sakes, that that perfect life could be put to reckon to us. But Bethlehem was just the prelude to Calvary, wasn't it? The cradle was with a view to the cross. The way of incarnation leads on to the way of crucifixion, a substitutionary death to suffer the penalties of God's law in the place of God's people. In my place condemned he stood. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But now this is my main point. Our triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit need not have entered into a covenant from all eternity to go through with this costly cure for our appalling condition. After all, it was a self Afflicted condition on the part of ungrateful rebels. So why did God choose to go this way in his son? What motivated him? Let me assert plainly and clearly that Jesus' submission here is no grudging, reluctant compliance. He himself has earlier on said about his life, I lay down my life of my own accord. He submits purely voluntarily. Well, you know the answer, don't you? I don't need to tell you. It's as basic as John 3.16, isn't it? God so loved the world. And the rest, as they say, is history. Indeed, it's his story. God's story, the old, old story of Jesus and his love. The Apostle Paul makes all this up close and personal, doesn't he? The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That means, as I read somebody say recently, his heart for me could... Could, just couldn't sit still in heaven. Your golden career opportunity may not knock at your door. You may not have been discovered by a talent scout. Your prince or princess charming may not walked into your life some enchanted evening. The title deeds to inheritance may not drop on your doormat ever. But your creator and sustainer became a human being who loved you to death. He left heaven's glory for hell's misery on the cross. Just for you. So have you really missed out on life? What love is this? We sang, didn't we? Wondrous love. Gethsemane indeed shows me what an appalling thing my sin must be. If it meant for Jesus there, going through that turmoil of Gethsemane and then the torture of Calvary to rectify my wrongness. What an appalling thing my sin must be. But Gethsemane shows me this, as does Calvary of course. What an amazing thing God's love must be if it was prepared to go through all that tall turmoil and torture for me, even for ungrateful, an ungrateful wretch like me. What amazingly generous love was this. God spared no cost. Unlike in the case of Isaac, God did not spare his son. And what greater proof of his generous love could the son give by giving himself? for me, not sparing himself but rather submitting himself to be the, the drastic but totally effective cure for our drastic and otherwise hopeless condition. And what amazingly gracious love this must be. 
God spared no cost while we were still sinners, we read. Ungrateful, unholy, rebellious. When sin was to God the abominable thing that revolts his soul and he hates, when it was still to me what somebody called our, to us our coddled treasure, our golem's ring very precious, our settled delight. While it was that to us and it was an abomination to God, he still loved me. That means you're more wicked than you can possibly imagine and yet you're more loved than you can possibly imagine. Truly it was love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. It was truly love to the loveless shown. So if you're not right with God yet, how can you go on refusing such a love as this? After all, in sparing no cost for the likes of you, God not is only seeking to rescue from a prospect, let's face it, a prospect far worse than your worst nightmare, and to give you freely and undeservedly a prospect far, far better than your wildest dream. And Christian, how can you, or shall I rather say, how can I, allow circumstances around me or struggles within me to tempt me to doubt such amazing grace and such, such amazingly great and such amazingly generous love? Just think. Because your sin was so appalling, because my sin was more, I say this again, was so appalling, far, far more, we're far more sinful in the eyes of God than we can possibly imagine. Not very hot morale boosting, I know, for a morning like this, but then as a, let me repeat this again. God's love is so amazing, so amazingly generous, so amazingly gracious, that it means that although you're far more sinful to God than you can possibly imagine, you're far more loved by God than you can ever possibly imagine, and perhaps for all eternity we'll never fully grasp how much we are in the heart of God, the loving heart of God. Well, I trust that all of us by grace may know that this is true for us personally. Whatever your circumstances might be, whether you're, whatever you're going through in life right now, whether it's health issues, money worries, family anxieties, lockdown blues, or even zoomed out blues, frustrations, heartaches, perhaps intensified grief because you couldn't hug the ones you deeply love. And if it helps, remember with Gethsemane in mind, some words of Richard Baxter and Calvary too. Christ leads me no, through no darker rooms than he went through before. He knows. And think what he experienced for your sake. Don't judge his love for you by what you're going through now. Judge his love for you by what he went through for you. As we see something of the amazing love here in Gethsemane, where Jesus shrinks from what lies before him, but nevertheless in love submits to what lies before him. Let's feel we can sing, if only we can sing the melody, from a, the melody from our hearts. Death and the curse were in our cup. O Christ, was full for thee, but thou hast drained the last dark drop. Tis empty now for me, that bitter cup. Love drank it up. Now, blessings draft for me. May that truly be true for you. Let's sing that hymn as we close. Shall we? If you've got a hymn book, it's um, before you, it's number 250, the words will appear before you on your screen, you're watching, if you're watching a screen, O Christ, what burdens bowed thy head. Number 250.
May God the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name, out of his glorious riches, strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And may you, being rooted and established in love, have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen.